Well, welcome to Flame of Truth again. I'm Pastor Dan. They call me Dan Smith from uh, the Garden Grove Church in Orange County. And just thrilled to be here on LBN. And we're doing a series for a while now called the uh, Old Testament Challenge. Got the idea originally from Willow Creek in uh, Chicago. And, uh, but we've done our own messages here. We're just going to have fun going through the great stories of the Old Testament. Can't cover them all. There's a thousand pages. But uh, we did last week, started with creation and all the issues of the Old Testament, difficult stories. And today we're going to do Noah. But everybody else is doing it, and we'll look at that. But before we get into the Word, love to have you uh, listen to this. Joshua Yap is going to play the piano, and the song is called Promised Land. Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> Amazing. I don't know where Elobian finds uh, all this music every time. Just incredible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let's uh, jump into our story. We're looking at Noah, looking through these Old Testament stories and trying to think this through. I just got back from Hawaii a few days ago, got a chance to speak for the Oahu camp meeting. And uh, seven years ago, I got to spend a whole month there. I deserved finally uh, a sabbatical. So I went over, took our family, and we uh, were homeschooling so we could just stay there for a month. Worked on writing a book. And after every about half a day, we'd work on uh, the book and other things we needed to do, homeschooling, we would head to the beach. And after we tried most of the main beaches, we, we pretty well went to the Kailua Beach over on the uh, Windward side. And I went there again last week just to recreate uh, the moment, sat on the beach and read and walked. We used to watch the, you know, the boys would go boogie boarding. We'd watch the kite surfers, and we'd swim from the buoys. It's just a great, great beach without any hotels or a lot of tourists. A great place. Sunset, we would uh, watch till the end of the sun going down. Then we would head over to the showers and rinse off all the salt water. 
get it dry, and then we would go to the shave ice store and buy a shave ice, and just two happy boys, probably 10 and 12 years old, having their shave ice, and go back to our room at night. Doesn't get much better than that. But when we got to our room, wonderful lady, I saw her again last week, uh, Auntie Frances, and, but it was a simple place, and we had, you know, it was hot, and $25 a night, you're in Hawaii, what's wrong with that? But it was simple, and we had our own friction sometimes, you know. My wife would maybe want to go to a museum, and the boy would want to go to, you know, to the beach, and I would want to go golfing, and we would all have this debate, okay, where are we going to go? Where are we going to eat? Taco Bell, Subway, home, restaurant, just difficult. We'd go to the Cold Stone ice cream. We were struggling to keep the lid on the bills. And so I would say, okay, you can have a small ice cream. No, why can't we have a big, a large, Dad? And I said, here we are, the Cold Stone ice cream, looking out over the Waikiki Ocean that everyone all over the world fights and dreams of coming, and here you guys are fighting. And here we have the juxtaposition of Kailua Beach, this magical utopia, and then this human family trying to find a way. Why can't we be happy living in this utopia? And that's the story of the Bible. God created this incredible world with a dream of what it ought to be, want it to be someday. John Ortberg uses the illustration of three chairs, the Trinity. We don't know exactly what the Trinity is, but there's a community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's love, oneness, forever. And God says at creation, let's invite a fourth chair and let's bring, let's bring more people into our community. That was the dream that we would have this magical, harmonious community forever with God. And yet, you see what happens. In Genesis 3, it says, The Lord was sorry he had ever made them. It broke his heart. Genesis 6, verse 8, His heart was filled with pain. And this verse is a huge picture of God. Sin doesn't make God mad at it like the pagan views. Sins make the gods angry. No, sin breaks God's heart because it's, it breaks the dream of what he wanted to accomplish with this community. I was dating Hilda. We're coming up to the 24th anniversary here soon. We were dating Hilda's Dutch, and we would go up to her Dutch family up on the California coast. And uh, they all had silver napkin rings with their name engraved. Well, I'm just the one she's dating. I'm not in the family. And so they would give me a ring from someone who wasn't there or a paper ring or no ring. And it was very clear who was in the family and who was outside until the first Christmas after we got married, November, December, Christmas. And I got a little box and opened it up. And there was my own silver napkin ring with my name engraved. I had gone from outside the community to do inside. It's amazing how that felt to be welcomed. And now, 24 years later, they are my family. And her brothers are my brothers, and I love them. They're part of this family. Community. That was the dream. And so we have to look at these first few chapters of the Old Testament. <laughs> the fall from the dream of what God meant it to be and hoped that it would be. Genesis 2.16, you are free to eat of any tree of the garden, but of this one tree. Number one, I think, the tree is a sign. It's a sign that God is absolutely committed to free choice. God has choice, and he makes us in his image, and he has choice. You can't have love without choice. And so, God, there has to be a way for that choice to be actualized. So God has a tree. Number two, I think it's protection. If Satan could only be in the area of the tree, then everywhere else they were safe. Satan is localized and isolated in one particular place. And then, of course, number three, why wouldn't God want them to have a knowledge of good and evil? Because now, as soon as they go to the tree and begin to eat of the tree, they would be saying, we have our own knowledge. We don't let God, we don't let anyone else tell us what to know. We will know for ourselves. We will decide. We will be gods, and we will decide what is good and evil? So here we have this sense of progression as we go from the very ideal dream down to where we are with sin. Is that it starts with questioning the goodness of God. At the very beginning of this great controversy, Satan says, you know, do you really think that God is a kind of God who would say, if you eat of the tree, you will surely die. You can't eat of something good that God has created. No, how can you love that kind of God? 
And so sin and temptation always starts with doubting the goodness of God. And when we understand that, then we can know how to reverse the process along the way. And so we have this doubt at the very beginning. The temptation is to say, I'm going to be cheated. If I, if I go all the way with God, I'm going to miss out. I'm going to miss out on something in the world. The party's going to be over. I'm going to miss out on some of the fun. It starts at the very beginning. I thought a lot about Genesis 3 and Revelation 3. You think about the parallels here. You know, we have the story of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. Here in Genesis, Satan says, if you eat of the tree, uh, you'll be like gods. And God says, no, you will not be like gods. You're going to be poor and hungry and miserable and naked. And Revelation 3 says the same thing. You think you're rich, but you're really poor and blind and miserable and naked. So that's the bottom line. Revelation 3 and Genesis chapter 3 have these parallels. Satan says, if you'll stick with God, you're going to be miserable. And Satan says, no, if you stick with him, you're going to be poor, blind, miserable, and naked. You have to decide. Satan says, eat this fruit and your eyes will be opened. And God says, no, if you eat of that, you're going to be blind. And so we have these, these issues. Satan says, if you eat this fruit, you'll be as God's. And Jesus says, no, you buy from me gold and you'll be rich. And you have to decide who is telling the truth. Are you going to believe Satan or God? Who is ultimately telling the truth? Where are you going to get the most life? Is it with Satan you'll be as God's, or is it going to be with God and you'll be rich? Who is telling you the truth? It starts from the very beginning. John 6, 63, Jesus says, My words are truth. Jeremiah 29 says, You know, I know my plans for you. My plans are good. You'll not be sorry. My plans are good, and they are not for evil. Who is telling the truth? And every commercial, every soap opera, all the billboards in the world are saying, part of Satan's lies, stick with us. You need this. You need to buy this. You need to go to this place. You need to drink this. You need to have this experience. You need to sleep around. If you, if you go to church, you'll be bored. There's too many rules. You're going to hate it. Come with us. And it's the same issue over and over again. And every one of us has to make a choice. It is the fork in the road. Are you going to go with God and church and religion and let him tell you where the best life will be? Or are we going to go the other direction? And no, it's in sex and money and travel and degrees and somehow self. That will be where life is really going to give it to you the best. You'll be as gods. You have to decide the fork in the road. And of course, the question is at the tree. When God says you will surely die, is it going to be punishment or is it the natural consequences of disconnecting from life? So there are huge issues right here at the very beginning. Theological forks in a row that will determine everything else you believe. Who is telling the truth? And what will be the consequences? What is God saying at the tree when he says you will surely die? What went wrong? When you decide what went wrong there in Genesis, it will have a bearing on what you think needs to be done to fix it. It is the problem that now we've offended a holy God and we've made God mad and we've made God angry and that is what has to be fixed. Or is the problem, there's a disease. We have a disease. Something has gone wrong with us. Something is very wrong inside and we need to be healed. Something needs to be healed and made right. There's a relational problem and we've broken a relationship and we need a relationship. How you decide what went wrong at the beginning affects how you think we need to go in order to fix it and to get it right again. It's a major fork in the road. When I had a bee sting over in Thailand, out in the ocean, what did I need? Had I made someone mad? Did I need forgiveness for that? Do I need legal, legal somehow uh, solutions? No, I needed to get to a hospital. I needed medicine. I needed a shot. I needed doctors who knew what was wrong and could give me what I needed to make me right again. It all depends. The remedy depends upon what went wrong at the beginning. Barbara Walters went over to Afghanistan, and she was talking to some people, and she saw that uh, 
women were walking behind, five paces behind men. And then she went back again five years later and saw that the very same thing was happening. They're still walking behind men. She thought, why hasn't this changed? Why are you walking five steps behind the men? You should be equal with them. And the woman said, no, landmines. <laughs> we want them to go first. See, Landmines. When God talks to us about how he wants us to live, is it because he is arbitrary and he has rules that he wants us to follow? And if you break them, it makes them mad. Or are they landmines? And God in love and grace says, let me tell you where the landmines are so that you won't hurt yourself. They are God's protections. If you eat of the tree, you will surely die. God is warning of where the landmines are and where it will cost you in life. You have to decide. A few years ago, there was a baseball player playing for the Los Angeles uh, Angels. Now he's playing, I think, uh, somewhere else. I just saw his name the other day. But he had a uh, temper problem, and he would make, uh, he would make the coaches uh, mad. And he would come off the field. If he got pulled off the field and someone substituted for him, he'd get mad and throw things and smash the water cooler. And the coaches got mad and said, you're off our team. We are done with you. Go anywhere else but here. Which is the picture? Is God warning us of where the landmines are? Or are we making God mad and say, get off our list. Get off our team. We don't want you around anymore. What is your picture of God? And Genesis 6 seems to be saying, sin doesn't make God mad. It makes God hurt. It breaks God's heart. He knows that we've, we've hurt ourselves. And we need to do something to heal that brokenness and that uh, disease that is within us. And so now the dream has been destroyed. God had a dream of the community, the four chairs. And instead of the dream, there's pain and there's suffering and there's killing and there's Cain killing Abel. And what has happened to this world that I had created? And it breaks God's heart. And maybe some of us need to think, what are you doing today that is break, breaking God's heart? What are you doing today that is falling short of God's dream for you, for your family, for your life, and who you are and what you were to be? That's what Romans 3 says. You know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God has a dream of what he wants us to be. Well, we need to go on further into the fig leaves. It says in Genesis that when they realized that they were poor, blind, miserable, and naked, that they took fig leaves to cover themselves up. And today we just have more sophisticated fig leaves. It can be money. It can be materialism. It can be cars or houses or the way you walk or the clothes or jewelry or anything. Or it can be degrees and education after your name. I am somebody. Or it could be travel or it could be pleasure in food or sex or music. Or it can be criticism or gossiping trying to put other people down to make ourselves feel better. Just more fig leaves, fig leaves, trying to cover up the brokenness. And Jesus comes down and he says, no, not fig leaves. And he kills some animals and he covers them with skins. You need grace. And the rest of the Bible, but Genesis and the rest of the Bible are all this constant cycle between sin and grace. They eat of the fruit, fig leaves, and then grace, skins, sacrifices. Cain and Abel, bring, bring a lamb, symbol of grace for your sin. No, he brings fruit, and he kills his brother, their sin. God has to come and make a promise. And all the way through all the stories, sin and then grace. Where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. I made you to have a community. That is what sin is. We're breaking the dream, the four chairs, us with God, the Trinity. God invites us into his holy inner circle, and the dream gets shattered again. And finally, God says, Let me, I'm going to have to have a plan to restore this community, the dream that was there. And now we come to the flood. The spiral hits bottom. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord sees how great man's wickedness has become. It was everywhere. They, it was all the time sin had spread all over the world. It had permeated all of them, and they thought evil thoughts all the time. There was nothing good. The theologians call it total depravity. There's just something inside of us that we're willing to hurt ourselves or hurt other people. If somehow we think it'll make our lives better, if we think we're missing out on something, take from someone else. We have this capacity to do that from the very beginning. 
And so the message of Genesis 3 to 11 is that there is sin everywhere. We have to just acknowledge it. It is not just on the Jerry Springer TV show, or it's not just the 9-11 terrorists are over there or downtown in the slums or someplace. It's in all of us. It's in you. It's in me. It's in our kids. It's in Loma Linda. It's in our universities. It's in our churches. It's all over. It's just in us. Sin is pervasive. It is the one thing more event and says we don't need the Bible to tell us. We can see it ourselves. All have sinned. The dream has been broken. Something is wrong. And God decides he's going to have to wipe the slate clean and just start or uncreate the world, reverse the creation, and just said, it hasn't worked out. Let's wipe the slate clean and start over again. And so he puts it back to the way it was. We have the waters of chaos. We had the waters before. Now the waters of chaos comes back over the world and we'll undo and get it back to where we were and see if we can sort of start over. And so he says to Noah, Genesis 6, verse 14, so make yourself an ark. We're going to have an ark. You think about the number 500. Noah is 500 miles from any ocean. He makes an ark that can fit 500 freight cars in there, and he's 500 years old. He's never seen rain. And yet somehow for 120 years he is going to build an ark 500 miles from any ocean, just because God said so. Someone comes along, what are you doing? Building an ark. What are you going to do with the ark? Save my family and whoever wants to come with us when we have a flood. How many children do you have? Noah was 600 years old when they went into the ark. He'd been building for 120 years, so he started when he was 480. When did he have his first children? 500 years old. He started building an ark. 20 years before he had any children. Incredible faith to build an ark 500 miles from an ocean, 500 years old for 500 freight cars for children he didn't even have. And his neighbor wanted to say, how many children are you planning to have? The faith of Noah to build the ark. Well, now we have the two hard questions. How could God destroy everybody, even the innocent animals, and I think the best answer is God just couldn't bear to have the world just fall apart and have the whole world be destroyed if they destroyed it themselves before he had a chance for the dream to be accomplished, for people to have a demonstration of what the world could be and a community could still be. And because, look, at they were going to kill themselves. He says, let me just stop it now and start over again. I can still have a few people that might be able to create the community and show the world what it was supposed to be like. What are you going to do? And then the second question, where is grace in all this terrible destruction? God is a God of grace. Even in the Old Testament, where is grace in this story of God destroying the world? Number one, he waited thousands of years before he did. This was not just overnight, okay, made a mistake. Thousands of years between creation and the flood. God giving it time, giving people a chance. Number two, he gave them 120 years. 120 years as a chance to come in. Oh, the whole time with an open door. Number three, he provides an ark. You don't have to die. The ark is large. It's big enough for everybody who wanted to go. And the door was wide open. Number four, when the flood was over, he made a covenant. Genesis 8, 21, never again will I destroy all living creatures, even though every inclination of his heart is evil. And that's what grace is, even though. Even though there's evil everywhere, even though I will never do this again. So there's grace in that story. And number five, it is the whole message of the Old Testament. God never gives up. He creates a world, they sin. He gives them the skins. Cain and Abel kill one, kills the brother, doesn't give up. Over and over again, Abraham, Noah, all these stories. The cycle of sin and then grace. God will never give up. Going to have an ark and somehow start again, try to start over again. Still has a dream of getting that community, the four chairs, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and us, you and me. And then finally, number six, there's a hall of fame at the end of the Bible in Hebrews chapter 11. All these giants of faith, not perfect, and there they are, you know, the giants, Abraham, 
Moses, and Noah. Not perfect, but Noah, 120 years, preached the message, got into an ark, never seen rain, just took God's word seriously, went into the ark. God is a God of grace all the time. But everybody else is doing it. Can you see these two groups? One group says, okay, we're going to take God seriously. We never heard of rain. We're 500 miles from an ocean. We're going to take it seriously. We're going to build an ark, and we're going to go in. The other group says, we've never seen rain. We're having a party. Everyone else is doing it, but no one else is going in. Only eight are going. Everyone else is out here. And there are the two groups, the ark party and the party outside. How many times have you heard your kids say, but everyone else is doing it, Dad? Everyone else. Are you willing to go against the grain, to go against the party, to go against the majority and be a minority to say, I'm taking God's word seriously no matter what, and I'm going to go in the ark. If there's an ark, I'm going to go in. If God says it, I'm going to do it. Which group are you in? Genesis 6 to 9 is ultimately a story of the two groups. One group that goes in, that takes God's word seriously, and the other group says, everyone else is doing it. We're going to take, it. We're going to take a chance and stay out here where the party is going. What are you going to do? Which one are you going to decide? And ultimately, you have to trust God. It is only going to destroy the evil. God never destroys anything that is good. It's only the evil that died in the flood. The good was preserved. God never takes anything out of your life that will be good for you. He only destroys what will hurt. And then, of course, we jump all the way down to the end of the story. Jesus is the real Noah. Another carpenter. Noah is a carpenter. Christ is a carpenter. Both working with nails. Both working with wood. And Jesus dies on a wood of a cross, which is the real ark. Christ builds an ark on the cross. Noah builds an ark to save people across the flood. Jesus has a cross which will save us across the flood at the end of the world. Which group are you going to be in? The group that's in the minority that goes in or stays out, you choose.